exactly. They hate us because they ain't us. <laughs> That's a great saying, okay? I've got a butthole, and it's working overtime. Yes, I P M. You know what's more destructive than a nuclear bomb? Words. Nukes proliferate. This is proliferation, a game about nuclear strategy. But actually, you play as nations of the world threatening to nuke each other while talking like you're at the United Nations or something. Yes, weaponized nukes are bad. This is a game that's dealing with them in a lighthearted way, so if you're not vibing with that, just click off. You play as North Korea, or Motherland Russia, or the US of A. Just amass the most money while trying to survive the longest. Filled with bluffing, backstabbing, and weapons of mass distraction, I mean destruction, Proliferation is a medium weight political game for 2 to 9 players. However, we only tested it at the 4 and 5 player count due to the nature of the game and also due to our time constraints. It's also at least an hour, but talkative groups need to a lot more time. This is a sponsored review, but as always, that is not affecting scoring. This is also the economy version of Proliferation, which is $45 on their Kickstarter page. It is now $80 if you want to buy it through their website. How to play! Goal of the game is to hit your country's consolidating power goal, like having a certain amount of money or EP on your turn. Each country has a different goal for this. Or you can just be the last one standing after everyone nukes each other. Oh yeah, speaking of nukes, your country has five lives, and each nuke fired upon a country typically does one damage, but sometimes they do more. When it is your country's turn to be the speaker, basically meaning it's your turn, you'll flip over an event card that has any range of effects for one player or multiple players. Next is the main phase of the game, policy, where you as a speaker can buy anything you want on the board. Just pay the amount shown, mark that on your paper, oh and also your EP quantity is secret. To build up your economy, you can buy infrastructure that gives a flat boost, or trade agreements to have you and another country boost each other up. For the take that element, you can get mission cards to play on others, and counterplay cards called peacekeepers that let you discard opponents' missions. You can also get a permanent defense system that gives a chance of defending against nukes launched against you. And most importantly, you can buy the nukes, and their true strength isn't known until you buy them. Also, the policy phase is really important because that's where you as a speaker are allowed to play your cards from hand. Oh, also, it's where you can launch nukes on whoever you want if those nukes are face up, meaning they're primed. Otherwise, you cannot play cards from hand unless they say any time on them. Once you're done buying a speaker, you open the floor up for everyone to buy trade agreements. If multiple people want a trade agreement, they enter a verbal bidding contest for it. After that, you flip over a collection card, which tells the conditions for getting everyone's income, aka GDP, this round. You finish the round by doing a summit, where the speaker can start a vote to clear one of the rows of cards, put sanctions on someone, or lift the sanctions. Sanctions? What the heck? Okay, so now we'll explain more on the nukes. When you get them, they're hidden from everyone else until the beginning of your next turn, of which you have to reveal them, which primes them. If you launch a primed nuke during your policy phase, you immediately get sanctioned, meaning you don't collect income during each collection phase, unless you get a lucky die roll. As for the actual nukes flying through the air, yes, they blow up on that country and do a certain amount of damage, and also give a nuclear winter. If you have one of these tokens, you only collect your base GDP come collection phase, which is only three. Yeah, you just keep rotating who's a speaker every turn, filling in all these gaps at the start of each turn with cards. And then on your turn, you're mostly deciding how to buy and play cards. And then you can see who to nuke. And then at the end of the round, you flip over this collection card and you collect your money, possibly. Depends on what the card says. Oh yeah, you also do a voting phase, which usually involves sanctions in some way. Bros! Proliferation has some notable components. Like, the box it comes in has some card dividers so you can easily set up and put away the game. Pencils are nice quality and pre-sharpened, and the nuclear winter tokens feel exceptionally thick for just cardboard. Oh, and the paper you get for this game to write on has a toughness between printer and construction paper. It won't be crumpling up anytime soon. Hooray for the player aids to explain all the phases of the game too, and a self-explaining sanction card. There's also some nice flavor text for the different nukes, from this French one to this smiling Indian one, and then the Trinity test from that open hyper movie. A lot of the nukes provide this learning experience mid-game. Gameplay pros time, and we have to talk about the buying of nukes. Proliferation isn't a game where you just mindlessly buy nukes to become the most nuclear proficient nation. No, it's more about when you decide to buy the nukes and how many you should buy if you decide to buy any at all. Spending cashes for nukes takes away from your chances of winning through an economic victory. You could have bought infrastructure or trade agreements to try to boost your economy instead of being destructive. It's here we really want to praise the design choice to hide players EP, meaning there's a lot of uncertainty about how close someone is to winning. Sure, you have an idea based off of everyone's GDP every turn and also how much starting money they had, but you're probably not going to be perfectly calculating everyone's EP anyways. So remember this trade-off as we get into the next pro, 
the whole uncertainty with the nuke system. So buying a nuke is filled with uncertainty because you don't know what it'll actually do until after you buy it. It could be a normal nuke at one strength, a two times power nuke, or a complete dud, or a dud that blows up in your face. You don't know what nukes people have until they reveal it on their next turn. This gives you a lot of time to bluff what you have. Oh, I have a super strong nuke. You better not sanction me, otherwise you'll regret it. And then on the start of my turn, I actually have a dud. Also huge shout out to the Star Bomba as a nation ending threat. A hilarious nuke that requires three entire rounds to prime and you declare someone to basically die after these three rounds are over. It's guaranteed to kill someone at five damage and it cannot ever be stolen or discarded while priming. Defense systems are a fun decision to buy too since you can scare people into buying them and they're a very expensive investment at 30 EP and they don't actually do anything if you're not fired upon. It only has about a 25% chance of blocking a nuke but if you roll a 20, it straight up deflects the nuke back to the owner. How's that for volatile gameplay? By now, we hope it's clear what type of lighthearted game proliferation is. And you'll have to consider the other offensive ways to spend money besides nukes. You can buy face down missions to maybe steal peacekeepers or infrastructure or straight up nukes. There's so much variety with missions as there's no exact repeats. Peacekeeper cards are another great more inexpensive option to decide to buy to infiltrate your opponent's hands of missions, discard their trade agreements, It can also be kept as a defense against other peacekeepers. You can't just launch nukes whenever too, because once you launch one, you get immediately sanctioned. So that really sucks for your economy. As such, there's a type of progression where players only want to launch nukes once they feel like they're really ready to kill someone, meaning that either they have five nukes on their own or they and a friend can add up to five damage to kill someone. You also wanna cleverly put yourself in a situation where you're not the last person to fire those nukes because you don't want the sanction on you. This is hard to get off. And if you're the person that didn't buy nukes, you're gonna be so much higher on your way to economic victory. But then all the nuclear powers are gonna be rightfully wary of you. There's no red in front of your play area. On the reverse, if you're the one buying nukes like crazy, you can't just secretly stash them up because you have to reveal nukes at the start of your speaker turns. Pretty cool how the mechanics allow for all players to react to both extremes of nuke buying here. And we have to say, getting nuked in proliferation properly feels like a nation getting nuked, where you lose one life out of five, and it's really hard to get health back unless you get some lucky mission cards. You also get nuclear wintered, which sends your country back to the dark ages with three measly income a turn. You're really hoping that when nukes are primed as the game goes on, that they're not pointing towards your country even though you may have five health because one nuke is one nuclear winter. That really sucks. This all culminates into the biggest pro, which is the negotiation possibility that proliferation has. Now, before I go further, I wanna point out that you can't actually trade EP freely between players. This initially seemed like a fair concession because trading EP with pen and paper could be a lot of unnecessary market. But as we kept playing, we realized that this restriction forces players to be more creative with negotiation. So let's start with these trade agreements right here. Everyone wants a better economy. So from the beginning of the game, a great way to boost that is to get trade agreements. But that requires cooperation to play, meaning that you have to hustle and bustle early game to get some partnerships across. Some great examples are bilateral agreement to take all your partner's infrastructure, permanent and additional. This can easily double your income or nuke pact and or speedy proliferation to get discounts on nukes or nuclear secrets to give primed nukes to each other. Holy cow. My favorite design is shared fates where both partners get a reroll of die, but they're partner has to pay for each reroll, meaning that you're kind of at the whim of your ally's generosity in a very politically turbulent game. These agreements are tying players to each other, and sometimes more than two players to each other because of the interlocking trade networks. Suddenly, you can't nuke that guy so easily because if you send your target into nuclear winter, that guy was paying for your buddies, North Korea's, rerolls. That sounds like a great excuse for glorious North Korea to find some new trading partners and break it off with you. Also, the fact that you can only break off trade agreements during your turn makes you question trade deeply because you wouldn't want to have an ally getting a much too convenient boost for an entire round before you have the chance to break it off again, huh? You max out at three trade agreements in total, including the ones your allies are using on you. So for the best economy, you want to at least be mindful of the option to break off trade agreements and start new ones as the power of balance shifts. Or you can do the really nasty thing and threaten to nuke someone or play nasty mission cards on them if they pull out of a trade agreement with you. I mean, hopefully these threats are valid, right? You don't know how strong the nukes are until the start of my turn when I review them. And my goodness, when someone gets sanctioned, you betcha they're trying as hard as they can to get that condition off of them. Money is so key in this game, so they can be threatening to nuke people unless they vote to take the sanction off of them, they can threaten to pull trade agreements, they can promise new agreements, the list goes on and on. And at any time, players can go full Armageddon mode and try to win through pure nuclear warfare 
Remember that you can buy up to five nukes a turn. And it's up to the economic leaders to just uh, use words. That's right, the economic leaders don't want to buy nukes because then they wouldn't be the economic leaders. So those with money must continually tell others, oh, you actually have a chance of winning through peace, it's not worth it to go full on nuke mode. Or just nuke our enemies first, we're on the same team, right? Of course, we have to talk about the asymmetry. Included are the nine nuclear powers of the world, you know, the ones that are known to have nukes. They invite differing play styles. They have different amounts of starting EP. They have two to three abilities and also different win conditions. There's Pakistan who is super aggressive. They buy nukes on their turn for one less cost, but they can buy nukes on anyone's turn. That means they have the flexibility of buying a nuke on the turn right before theirs then launching it at the start of their turn. Also, when they launch two or more nukes on their turn, they can get one more free nuke off of a die roll. What the heck? Or you can play as North Korea, who are uh, resilient for the strength of the Kim family to never get nuclear wintered. What the? <laughs> North Korea is too strong-willed to be bogged down by a little bit of Western propaganda that is nuclear fallout. You just have your tireless workers eat sawdust and keep working as your income can never get reduced. I mean, it's gonna get reduced to zero if the whole nation is nuked to oblivion, but that will never happen to invincible North Korea, right? Last one to go into detail is Russia. As for the motherland, you get an additional vote during the summit phase if you roll a three or more letting you have a lot of sway on especially sanctions. They can also hilariously get a free nuke anytime a nuke is discarded, meaning they want everyone to be grabbing nukes, then discarding them through as many take that abilities as possible. And the Russians need nukes to get their economic victory. There's also Israel that influences die rolls, China who is more control style and getting free peacekeepers every turn, and the USA who is an economic powerhouse with infrastructure and manipulating the collection drawn. We can't talk about all of them, but each nation does invite differing levels of aggression and allying potential. This gets us into the replay value of where you have these nine different powers and also these huge decks of cards. And there's very little repeats in these decks, especially with the mission deck. Included is an advanced diplomacy variant, which we did get to try, which adds two decks of cards, the clandestine missions and alliances. The former gives everyone some strong missions from setup and the alliance cards are expensive special abilities to buy on your turn to unlock all sorts of benefits. This variant does make you read more at the start of game and overall does make the game longer, but does give more agency early game as you have more starting missions to strategize around. To wrap up the pros, the nuclear proliferation geopolitical theme means the gameplay really well. You're playing as a nation who's playing kind of a game of greed chicken to see how much money you can get while not buying nukes while also fueling your opponents through trade agreements and by fueling your opponents you're giving them more money to have them buy nukes later on whether earlier or later nations will buy nukes for supposed defense they're claiming and then other nations will freak out and then want to buy nukes of their own Nations in power don't like it when smaller nations get nukes. Basically, proliferation is this parody of the UN where North Korea is there and gets to vote on sanctions for some reason, where there's a lot of pointing fingers and threatening to unload your nuclear arsenal. But you always want someone else to launch nukes, not you. You can roleplay to put yourself in the shoes of Kim Jong-un as North Korea allies with Russia, or the UK and Pakistan teaming up against India, or everyone sanctioning the United States who loves oil as their win condition. Cons! For visual cons, we're actually pretty peeved on how hard the central buying area, aka floor of the game, is to read. See, proliferation is a game listed at two to nine players, and if you're playing with a big group, well, some people are gonna have to read this upside down. Can you read these well? Not really. This doesn't matter for the nukes or peacekeepers, they're always the same from far away. Also the mission cards, all you need to know is their cost. But for the trade agreements, unless you have them memorized, it's an exercise of picking them up and reading them from across the table. Again, this wouldn't be an issue if proliferation was capped at four players, but it's not. There's actually a lot of wasted space on their infrastructure and trading agreements, so the font could be bigger. And we actually also suggest having the text printed facing both directions on the card. Talking about reading, remember how we said there's no exact copies in the mission deck? Well, that's true, but they happen to be named at the same thing multiple times. See, there's over 60 executive decision cards, which not only gets confusing in your hand, but also doesn't let you say the title when playing it because executive decision could really mean anything in this game. Why not give a subheader here at least, like executive decision, nuclear deterrent. The same goes for other missions like purification, where the abilities are similar, but not the same. Think of TI4 with its secret action cards. When someone plays a sabotage, you know exactly what it means. But in proliferation, you're like, uh, what does this specific sabotage do? The next component con is how there's no aid to the limit of each card you can have in your hand. Like I'm talking about missions, nukes, trade agreements, peacekeepers, infrastructure, basically everything in this game. Like there's not even one specific area in the rule book that lists all this stuff. You have to go to the term and then read the limit 
up there. Turns out that the higher tier of Kickstarter gets you the game mat, which does explain the hand limits in the center of the board for everyone. So if you got economy version like us, or if you buy the game off of their website, you really need to be getting the playmat bundle, which is another 40 bucks. Why not put this vital information on the player aid or the card since there's a lot of dead room on there as is? Or if you have a player aid explaining the peacekeeper and defense systems in depth, they wouldn't have to be a stack of cards. They could be tokens instead. I mean, it's not really a problem for them to be cards, but just saying this design could be cleaner. Card quality also seems to be on the low side. Like the cards feel good in the hand, but are thin and are sticking up in weird directions. This causes the decks to be off kilter, not a huge deal, and only time will tell if this will self-correct or not. We also had one rule confusion with the included expansion where we were confused whether or not the clandestine missions are treated as normal missions for the hand limit. This is because these clandestine missions say they follow the same rules and guidelines as the mission cards, but then later it says they're not actually missions. So they do have a different hand limit, but it would have been nice to see more examples of them being used. Gameplay con sign. Let's start with the event cards, which you draw one of every round and resolve it. Well, there's just a little bit too much emptiness going on with these. You can draw cards that literally do nothing or are talking about countries that aren't in your current game. This isn't game breaking at all, but more buzz kill as you can have multiple turns in a row where nothing happens for the events. Auto skipping events for countries that aren't in the game is a start. Or you could house rule that you can't have two rounds in a row where nothing happens twice. Next gameplay con has to do with player count. So this one's a little bit more uncertain because we only played it at four and five players. These concerns really stem from how much focus there is on each speaker turn. Speaker turns can first of all take a while because it's where you do the majority of your card play. If you're not the speaker, you can only buy the trade agreements. And those generally aren't too sought after come mid to late game if you're already set up. So then you're just waiting for the speaker to come back to you. So think about playing an eight, seven, or nine player game where you have to wait a really long time for the speaker role to rotate all the way around the table. There's also some mechanical imbalance at those player counts because going last gets worse the more players you have. The first player can start the game to purchase things to help their economy, while the last player doesn't even get the chance to boost their economy until almost the end of the round. So the later players in a round should get some starting boost to EP. Could be like a plus two EP for going last. This issue isn't insanely bad though because a game as self-balancing as this players later in the rotation could just ask for more trade agreements. Still, the sweet spot for this game does seem to be between four and six player counts, but we haven't tested the longer, larger player counts. There's also a variant to play the game at two players, but we didn't test that because it seems kind of against the spirit of this political game. The player count issue also goes into time where this game really isn't true to the one hour plus it says on the box. I mean, proliferation can be fairly short if you barely negotiate, but come on, then why are you playing this game? As such, the summit voting phase can be really lengthy if you have a talkative group. And then for each speaker's policy phase, where they can play all their cards, actually can invite some analysis paralysis because some cards can only be played during that phase. Also, if you're trying to win through being the last one standing, there's a lot of nukes that need to go off and you can be sitting there for at least two hours. And if someone draws a clutch heal card, that can drag out the game more. After looking at the Kickstarter, that says 30 to 90 minutes, which actually is more accurate if you factor in the two player variants. And perhaps 30 to 120 minutes is a better range. This lands us to the final con, player elimination. Once you get eliminated, you're just sitting there doing nothing. It's not too bad in this game. You won't get eliminated until round three at the earliest because nukes can only be bought in round two that need one round to prime. Also doing five damage to someone is not that easy to do. That's 50 EP for five nukes. The player elimination is more of the problem when the game runs longer than you would expect, past two hours, and people are still playing while you got knocked out a couple rounds earlier. Two nitpicks. First nitpick is that the box is too big. It could easily be two thirds a size and be fine. But hey, this could be this size because of all the extras you get in the higher tier Kickstarter versions. The last nitpick is the decision to have this weird honoring of people who'd died through nuclear explosions printed right on the box. So the side of the box reads, in dedication to those who have sacrificed themselves for the advancement of human knowledge, uh, blah, 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 suffered at the hands of a split atom. Ah, <sighs> yeah, this makes me feel kind of weird when reading it because proliferation is kind of like a party game with zany nuclear yelling and having this memorial line printed right on the box is kind of off-putting. Like it kind of takes you out of the fantasy bliss when reading that. But also someone who is really sensitive about nuclear warfare wouldn't care about a throwaway line like that. But again, this is not affecting scoring. Now it's time for a recommender score where we try to critically evaluate the game by weighing the aforementioned pros and cons with the caveat of whether or not this is even a good idea in the first place. Proliferation, a game you can buy right now, is gonna be a recommender score of seven out of 10. It is 
good. Before we go further, yes, this is expensive at 80 bucks for the components you're getting, but the replayability is really good to last you many, many playthroughs. At some point, I wanted to give this an 8 out of 10 recommender, but there's just too much jank overall, especially at that price point, so this fits at a comfortable 7 out of 10. Proliferating nukes has a really self-explanatory theme that's really easy to visualize. Like you're all just sitting there at the UN, yelling at each other, writing down secret money, and then there's just a lot of hidden cards to bluff and threaten each other out. There is a nuclear arms race that runs parallel to the economic secret game you have going on. A little bit like Sid Meier's Civilization, but your military is more like mostly nukes, sanctions, and then some take that cards. To explain proliferation a little bit better, we want to bring up the party game Halapagos, where you play semi-cooperatively to escape a deserted island, trying to get enough food, water, and rafts to escape. Wait, how is that related to nuclear proliferation? Well, both of these games can be seemingly very peaceful at times. In Halapagos, you can even win as a team. But the peace in these games is shaky, and if there's problems, you gotta vote people in both of the games to punish them. These are also both games where antagonizing is kind of the point of the game. In proliferation, you can't really be too sure on who to turn on at some points because there's so much hidden information. Think of a game with hidden objectives, mafia, bang, or even some area controls. These give clear reason for players to be targeting each other. Sometimes in proliferation, you just have to say, oh, I have an inkling of a feeling that person is winning, but the other guy is antagonizing me so hard, and I think his mission card sucks, so I'll just nuke him for the heck of it. The EP can be mathed out for those with amazing memory, but economic scrutiny is not why you play proliferation. Proliferation also has a much higher buy-in than Halapagos, with more time, more rules, but also more negotiation possibility. You also just can't get knocked out right away. But proliferation isn't an area control with negotiation, mind you. The game is still swingy and there's a lot of silly RNG draws everywhere. Just think of spending all your money on nukes and then to get nukes that blow up in your face and just end up killing you. Okay, well then you might as well just try to start as much chaos as possible before you die. Anyways, if you like the constant bluffing economic maneuvering to make yourself seem slightly more threatening while your nukes are all duds and then your nation is supposedly bankrupt again, this is a recommendation to get this game for at least four to five players. None of the cons are really that concerning for a group that size. Just make sure you have the personalities and time to dish out the drama. It's very much a gamer's party-ish game that is expanded to the length of a normal board game at one to two hours. And especially get proliferation if you like the terms, shut up, I'm gonna nuke you, or you're gonna say that while these nukes are all pointed at you? Nuclear meltdowns are inbound to your table. And to go off of the more casual approach to game night, there's lots of blank cards. I mean, two of each kind to add your own ability to the game. So you can add whatever the heck you want. Now, the big question is, there's nukes in this game and you can play as India. But where the heck is Gandhi, huh? Where is he? He's just begging to be in this explosive game. My personal score for proliferation is gonna be a seven out of 10. I have a good time with it. I enjoyed the geopolitical theme, although some more arts in the game overall and maybe some characters would be nice to make the game feel less abstract. For reasons said in the pros, I like it when the negotiation comes together with all the nuke bluffing. Like any offensive thing in this game, like Pakistan, it will just terrify me and just have me keep trying to sweet talk people. Pakistan getting nukes? Yeah, that's a potentially free nuke, so we gotta make sure we sanction him, guys. Proliferation invites really good discussion for our friend group during and after the game because we're all just talking about how we could have negotiated differently. And then we're also trying to find out what each other's secret cards really were. The second time we played, it was a really tense game of me playing as the glorious leader of North Korea. And I managed to get incredible trade deals early on, quickly skyrocketing to 20 GDP a freaking turn. So half the table was trying to sanction me while I was trying to pin the threat on the growing United States who was getting 17 EP a turn. I kept telling the neutrals and my Russian ally that I was spending the money and I didn't have much left. Meanwhile, my EP was blasting past 40 and then 60. And even after I got sanctioned, I got a lucky roll to hit 80 EP. Then my Russian ally totally misplayed out of anger to nuke someone that kept antagonizing him. So the sanctions immediately got lifted off of me and went to him. So then I collected the final 20 EP at the end of his turn and won the game at the start of my turn. Very memorable to have that gotcha moment at the start of turn. But upon thinking if I wanted to play again, I kept thinking proliferation has maybe a little too much, slightly too much for what it is, the keck it is. Like five health for each player seems slightly too much, but again, it makes sense so you can't immediately nuke people and you can keep talking, but it makes the game feel long. Then having to manage mission cards, peacekeepers, and also trade agreements seems like a little too many cards. Like to me, this is just the card game where the vast majority of it is table talk, your hidden EP and the asymmetry. So there's not that much interesting going on in terms of board state. 
Rather, it's how people feel and the nastiness they might have in hand. So it kind of just adds up to a game where there's a lot of talking, but not a lot actually happens. Until, of course, there is the climactic explosions with the nukes which I find resolving to be just average gameplay. You know a game where there's a lot of talking and a lot of interesting stuff happens? TI4! Because that is justified to being long with the grand scale, very interesting area control, and thematic elements everywhere. You don't vote that often, and when you do, it feels more impactful. But yes, this is my opinion, right? TI4 is a very long game. Yeah, I would play Proliferation again, but I'm thinking after one or maybe two plays, my personal score will drop to a 6 out of 10, just because of the enjoyment versus time allotted I'm getting out of it. Proliferation's beauty to me is how players decide to shift alliances while being very fuzzy about who's actually close to winning through all the secret writing going on. It's a feeling I've gotten in much bigger, more epic games, but now in a package I can easily teach people and with a much lower runtime. The table rightfully erupts as people play their hidden cards, and I just can't wait for when someone rolls a 20 on the defense system. I can see many shades of greatness going off proliferation, but at this time point, I keep thinking I'm more inclined to play another medium weight game. But I do have some friends that are just clamoring to play this game, so I'll probably get another gameplay in before the year ends. Thanks for watching the video. Again, this is not a Kickstarter, you can buy it right now. And this being sent to us did not affect scoring. Thank you to all our patrons right here. Let me know what you think of this game. If you see any games like it, you can recommend to me. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you to our Mad Lads of Cardboard. And I will see you guys later. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Let me know what you think. Yeah, like, comment. Bye-bye.